I'm going to start off by introducing my co-conspirators. Martin is here. Martin, stand up a minute. I, I'm doing this because if there's any difficult questions at the end, <laughs> my, my co-authors are going to uh, help me, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, well, and uh, at the back there, I can see Paul hiding. Paul Carr. Um, what, what, what happened here was that, uh, quite coincidentally, Paul and I in Australia and Martin... Where were you doing your work? In Prague? Prague, yeah, mostly. And uh, Martin in Prague, we're working on essentially the same thing. It's, uh, it really is very much a team effort. So um, anyway, as I say, if the, if the questions get difficult, Paul and Martin will step in. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, bit of a funny title, really, isn't it? Debunking uh, Cupro Adamite. Uh, I think probably everybody in the room is um, very familiar with Adamite. Uh, slightly rare at Sumeb, um, copper-free adamite, uh, not too many of them around. We're also pretty familiar with olivonite, uh, the, the copper end of that <laughs> solid solution series. The difficulty comes with naming the intermediate members. And uh, again, I, I suspect that many of us have tended to say, well, if it's pale green, it must have some copper in it, so we'll call it cuproadamite or cuprian adamite. If it's darker green, probably nearer the olivonite end of the series, so maybe zincian olivonite or zinc hyphen olivonite. But realistically, we've never defined the limits in terms of how much copper do you need before you call it a cuproadamite or how much zinc do you need before you call it a zinc olivonite? So those are some of the things that we're going to be thinking about in, in a few moments' time. Uh, interestingly, uh, that problem has really been taken out of our hands by the description of a new mineral species and by the nomenclature rules that are set for us by the IMA. And we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But first of all, I wanted to go through a few historical observations because I think the Adamite Olivonite series at Sumeb has been surprisingly misunderstood and misidentified over the years. The, uh, the mineral Olivonite was recognized right from the early days and uh, Mark Feingloss mentioned just now that uh, Otavite was the first new mineral described from Sumeb and in the description paper by Schneider in 1906 he talked about massive olivonite and columnar crystals of olivonite. So olivonite really was recognized very, very early on. A couple of years later, Mauker, working for these, for, on these massive bulk samples that were sent to Germany for metallurgical testing, identified several habits of, uh, of olivonite. And he was really the first person to realize that some of that olivonite was enriched with zinc. And he noticed that a little bit more zinc in the olivonite structure led to better shaped crystals and had an influence on the color. And then Willem Klein, uh, 1938, well, he considered olivonite to be pretty abundant at Sumeb, particularly in the top 400 meters of the ore body. And uh, he noted particularly fine crystals uh, between three and four level occurring with malachite and azurite. And we're quite familiar with that sort of material. This is one of Klein's specimens in the collection at Harvard University. This is a 20 centimeter boulder from the Sumeb open pit. And I think what's quite notable about this specimen is that it's a relatively unusual habit of olivonite, these very long acicular crystals, exceptionally to 25 millimeters, lovely specimen. And there's a very similar specimen attributed to the Sumeb open pit in the Kegel collection in the Smithsonian as well. This is perhaps the more typical habit that uh, most collectors are familiar with from the first oxidation zone, these blocky equant crystals. And this is in a, a matrix of massive olivonite and malachite with a little bit of residual sulfide as well. Now, adamite does occur in the first oxidation zone, but interestingly, it wasn't really recognized, at least not in the formal literature, in the earlier part of Sumeb's history leading up to the Second World War. <laughs> this specimen is in the Klein collection, and Klein wrongly identified it as Sumebite. This is another specimen in the Karabacek collection, also at Harvard, and this was one of the specimens that Karabacek used to try and tempt 
Charles Palace to buy the collection. It was said to be a unique Vesalite specimen from Sumeb. In actual fact, X-ray diffraction very quickly showed it to be Adamite. But I think it's very interesting that although green Adamite clearly occurred in the first oxidation zone at Sumeb, it was misidentified, misunderstood. There seemed to be a reluctance to accept that Adamite could be green. Yes, you could have a livonite that was enriched in zinc, but the idea that Adamite could be enriched in copper and show as a green mineral just didn't seem to, to work for the early observers of Sumeb. The only reference that I can find to Adamite in pre-war literature is an unpublished reference, again in Karabacek's sales prospectus that he sent to Palachi at Harvard. And uh, this, is in the, this, this document is in the Harvard collection. And uh, again, it was one of the great selling points for the, uh, for the collection, this cobalto anatomite. And uh, you can see, I think, at the end of the specimen here, that rather nice magenta crystal, uh, crystal color, which is, is very characteristic of cobalto and adamite, for want of a better term, because we'll come back to that in a minute, at, uh, at Sumeb. Now, after the Second World War, when the Sumeb Corporation took over, and drilling and mine production and mine development started to penetrate the second oxidation zone, they started to find an awful lot more adamite. And the first formal reference to adamite in the literature is by Strunz, Sung, and Geyer in 1958. And they simply mentioned that, the adamite, uh, that adamite was found in the first and second oxidation zones. And then Strunz in 1959 described an occurrence of cuproadamite, cuprian adamite, from the second oxidation zone on level 30. And he obviously thought it was sufficiently novel that he provided crystallographic data and optical data as well, and drawings of the crystals, as you can see. And I think that really is, is, is very consistent with just how unusual that was considered to be at the time. But as the second oxidation zone was mined, more and more adamite was encountered, culminating, of course, with uh, what Desmond Sacco and Bruce Cairncross called the famous find on 30 level in 1986. And uh, this is an 11 centimeter specimen. Interestingly, the, uh, the miner who discovered this believed he had a rather unusual form of dioptase and sold it very cheaply. He didn't realize he had the world's best Cuprian adamite. And uh, as mining went on down into the third oxidation zone, other examples were found as well. And I think we would all agree now that what we're loosely calling Cuprian adamite is a pretty common mineral at Sumeb. So that's the history. Um, a little bit of science. We've got a solid solution series from the zinc-rich end member adamite going through to the copper-rich end member olivonite. Now, Studies of synthetic material have shown that in theory, there is complete compositional solid solution between the, <coughs> excuse me, between the two. Interestingly, adamite is now known to be orthorhombic. In fact, adamite was always known to be orthorhombic. But in the, uh, in the last 30 years or so, with uh, much more accurate X-ray diffraction techniques, it's been realized that olivonite is monoclinic. Now, the angle that makes it monoclinic as opposed to orthorhombic is a very, very tiny deviation from 90 degrees, which is why it took so long to realize that there was a symmetry change. And in synthetic materials, that symmetry change occurs at roughly 80 mole percent copper. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Don't, uh, don't worry about that too much at the moment. But it is just important to recognize that there is a, a, a structural difference between those two end members. Now, in 2005, and don't worry about the 2007 reference there, the, uh, the IMA approved a new mineral in 2005. The paper was only published in 2007. But uh, a group of Russian scientists, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce their names, defined a new species within that solid solution and they called it zinc olivonite. No hyphen, so a little bit different to the, uh, the varietal name that I showed on the screen a bit earlier. And they defined zinc olivonite as the cation-ordered analog of olivonite and adamite. 
What on earth does that mean? We'll come back to that in just a second, but before I do, I want to just say that at the same time, the IMA officially discredited the name cuproadamite. Now, let's think about what this, uh, this strange definition really means. Now, I'm no crystal chemist, Martin is, so if we want to go into the detail of that, uh, I'm hoping Martin might oblige so that, uh, to spare my blushes, but very simplistically, there are two separate cation sites in the adamite olivonite structure. And as we all know, the rest of the mineral is made up with the arsenate anion with a little bit of hydroxide on the end. Now, one of those sites, I've called it site one here, prefers to be filled with copper. The other one, site two, prefers to be filled with zinc. The reason they have a different preference is down to a, a phenomenon called Jan Teller distortion, which we don't need to go into here unless anybody would like to tackle Martin later. This representation here, I've got my bricks on the site one and site two all shown in blue. They're all showing zinc. So that's a representation of N member adamite. Let's think about what happens if we start to substitute copper. If we put a little bit of copper in, zinc is still the dominant element in that site. So we really don't need to think about a, a name change. We won't worry about the thresholds at which we might start to describe this as maybe copper bearing adamite. If we add a little bit more, we're still zinc dominant. Maybe we call this copper rich. We don't need to worry about that too much. If we add a little bit more, though, we now have copper dominant in that first site. And the IMA's dominant cation rule means that we have to call this a new species because one ordered site is now dominated by a different cation. And as we cross from 25% zinc uh, sorry, 25% copper to a higher level of copper, or if you like, in just the one site, we go above 50%, we come into the compositional range of zinc olivonite, which is the new mineral. We add a little bit more copper, we fill up that site one completely with copper, and we're now at the ideal composition of zinc olivonite, right in the middle of the solid solution series, 50 mole percent copper, 50 mole percent zinc. Then we start substituting copper into the other site. And we can put two of our five bricks in as copper. We are still dominant zinc in the other site, so we are still in the field of zinc olivonite. But as soon as we move to dominant copper in that second site, we are now out of that compositional range of zinc olivonite. And we're talking perhaps about an olivonite, but I'll come back to a little bit of a complication there in just a moment. And of course, if we fill up with copper completely, we're now into N-member olivonite composition. So this is how the series looks now. Uh, I've put mole percent copper along the top of the graph there, mole percent zinc along the bottom, and you'll see there that as we go above 25 mole percent copper, we pass from adamite into zinc olivonite, and as we go above 75 percent, something changes again. Now I say something changes again because olivonite is monoclinic, but this series only becomes monoclinic at 80 percent copper. So we've got a bit of a question mark as to what we would call a natural composition between 75 and 80 mole percent copper. And to my knowledge at the moment, no consistent natural compositions in that range have been found. We can do it synthetically, but nothing in that range has been found. Now, I was talking to Stuart Mills uh, at, the uh, at um, Museum Victoria in Australia about this, and he was saying, well, you, you know, if you can bring to me a, a, a mineral that is monoclinic and consistently has something between 75 and 80 per, uh, mole percent copper, you've probably got a new mineral. So again, just a little bit of a, a thought on how new, na naming new minerals might happen. The problem with this is that it gives us as collectors some identification headaches. Uh, we can determine olivonite from the adamite zinc olivonite series just. It's not easy, but we can do it by X-ray diffraction. But ideally, we need to have a fully quantitative analysis 
in order to be sure which of these species we're dealing with. Because imagine, for example, that we have a... It's the right button here. Imagine, for example, that we have a, a composition right on this dividing line. If the average composition is 24.9 mole percent copper, it's atomite. If it's 25.1, it's zinc olivonite. And it really is that fine an issue. So to be sure, you need to analyze these things. And of course, not all of us have the budget or the inclination to start commissioning extensive batches of, uh, of quantitative microprobe analyses. So what Martin was trying to do and what Paul and I were trying to do on the other side of the world was work out if there are any reliable physical properties, either habit or luster or color or association, that we could say, well, these properties suggest that there is a very high probability that this is zinc olivonite or a very high probability that this is adamite. And that's really what the rest of this talk is all about. And as I go through the next few slides, I'm sort of thinking that many people in the audience here will say, oh, well, I've got one like that, and I recognize that habit. And I think you'll be quite intrigued as to how the analyses turn out for some of these specimens. So we took 43 specimens of uh, Adamite olivonite series minerals between us. Uh, we deliberately selected for a range of colors and habits and associations, as I said. We did between three and eight analyses per specimen to give us a, a total of 182 analyses. Obviously, we're interested in analyzing for copper and zinc because it's the copper-zinc ratio that uh, determines which species we're dealing with. But we also analyzed for iron and cobalt because it's clear from the literature that we do get a little bit of substitution of those two elements into the cation sites as well. And of course, we analyzed for arsenic because these are, these are arsenates and also on the possibility that there was a little bit of phosphate substitution, unlikely at SUMEB because there's not a lot of phosphorus around, but uh, we analyzed for, for phosphorus as well. And that, as you can imagine, gave us an awful lot of numerical data, which I'm Certainly not going to bore you with here, but here's Paul. You'll recognize the distinctive hairstyle sitting at the, uh, sitting at the microprobe in Canberra. And uh, this was when we went to do this work. And um, this is one of the representations of the data that we produced. So what we've done here is to calculate the number of atoms of zinc and the number of atoms of copper per formula unit. And you'll remember that there are two cation sites. The, uh, if we call a cation M for now, the formula is M2. So zinc and copper should add up to two atoms per formula unit. The reason that the data doesn't quite plot on a straight line is that little bit of substitution of cobalt and iron into the, uh, into the cation sites. But essentially there, you've got three groups of data. And uh, there's nothing particularly clever about this. It, it, it's, uh, it's just a fact that anything that will plot between 25 and 75 percent. Now, it's important to make the point that is 50 percent of this solid solution series. All of that is zinc olivonite. Zinc olivonite is much more common at Sumeb than either olivonite or adamite. The yellow, the, the yellow spots at the top there, below 25 mole percent copper, those are the adamites. And the, uh, the greens are the, uh, the, the darker green squares are, are, are the olivonites, obviously. But what I want to just uh, point out to you, and I will do this by means of the next slide, this is the distribution of the average compositions of the 43 specimens. If we look at uh, these, ooh, wrong button, I think. If we look at uh, these two specimens here, the key to this chart is that I've said these are the mean compositions. Those two specimens that plot as adamite are actually hybrid specimens that include both zinc olivonite and adamite. In actual fact, the adamite parts of those specimens plot down in this range here. So we really have a trimodal distribution of data here. The end member adamites are well towards the end member. The zinc olivonites tend to cluster towards the middle of the zinc olivonite compositional range. And the olivonites tend to be pretty much towards the end member end of the uh, olivonite range as well. Not quite so clearly as the, uh, as the adamites. But again, you can see it. They do form a separate group. And this gap here 
is the gap I was talking about earlier where we're not seeing natural compositions. That's where this symmetry change is a bit of an issue as to how we would name things. Unfortunately, we can dodge the issue for now because we're not finding any compositions in that particular range. So let's have a look at a few, uh, a few specimens and we'll start off with a, a nice yellow adamite. Now I don't think any of us would have remotely thought that that was a cupro adamite or a cuprian adamite and sure enough the copper over copper plus zinc percentage is just 0.003%. There's no copper in this. This is essentially end member adamite. The next one, these are rather nice large crystals of adamite, crystals to about uh, 15 millimeters. And uh, there's a green cast to this certainly, but it is a little bit different. And I think the, the green cast is partly due to the size of the crystals. In actual fact, they're very transparent. And here that, uh, that copper over copper plus zinc number is just 0.6%. Again, we're clearly dealing with an atomite. Here are some colorless to brown crystals. And uh, to give you a, a better idea of what these look like, you know, superficially, they're the sort of tone of a nice, gemmy, smoky quartz. And again, the, uh, that copper number is coming out at just 0.79%. Again, very clearly an atomite. Here we have yellow tabular crystals arranged in little subspherical aggregates. The copper number here, 1.77%. Again, very much an end member atomite. And here we jump across that gap because in this specimen, we've got equant spearmint green crystals. There are also some darker olive green ones here, but we're analyzing, in this case, the spearmint green crystals. And that copper number has suddenly become 31.54%. It's above the 25% threshold. This is a zinc olivonite. And here's another zinc olivonite, this time emerald green crystals. We've moved that copper ratio up again to 37.61%. It's a zinc olivonite. Spearmint green crystals again, equant crystals this time, not, uh, not particularly exciting looking specimen, but we're now up to 40% copper, zinc olivonite again. And of course, now we're starting to approach the middle of the zinc olivonite compositional range. Here we get to 42.7% copper with the spearmint green crystals. Spearmint green crystals again, this time really chunky quant things, 43.6% copper. These are a little bit different because the, the color of these is, is odd. It's a sort of gray green and uh, framboidal masses of, uh, of equant crystals, 44.26% copper, zinc olivonite. And uh, a fairly familiar habit, Prismatic crystals, spearmint green, 45.47% copper, zinc olivonite. This is a tenantite specimen coated in spearmint green crystals of zinc olivonite, 45.6% copper. Rather pretty emerald green crystals, pseudo-octahedral under the microscope, 45.6% copper. Nice prismatic gemmy emerald green crystals, almost perfect mid-range Zinc olivonite, 51.25% copper. Radiating clusters of emerald green zinc olivonite crystals, 55% copper. This is uh, a specimen from, a very poor specimen I might add, but uh, from that famous find. I showed you the Desmond Sacco specimen earlier, which is uh, somewhat better than this. But um, these radiating sprays of slightly darker green. I've called them bottle green crystals. Now we're up to 64% copper. And here we're getting into something that we might think very seriously as to whether we should be calling this cuprian adamite. It's too dark, isn't it? We'd probably have called this olivonite anyway. And sure enough, we've jumped that gap. We've jumped into the monoclinic symmetry. This is 80.3% copper. This is olivonite. Again, bladed crystals, black, blackish green, 92.9%. We're getting towards end member olivonite now. And here we're right up to 96.8% copper. This is a very typical habit, these blackish green equant crystals close to end member olivonite. And here again, I think this is, uh, I think this is the, uh, the closest we get to end member composition for, uh, for uh, olivonite at 98%. 
But things are not always quite so simple. We do have a number of specimens, I think all of us have a number of specimens, where you have either zoned crystals or you have two different appearing crystals of the same Adamite Livonite series. And on this specimen, for example, bottom left, you've got the spearmint green crusts, which are zinc olivonite. Top right, you've got brownish pseudo-octahedral crystals that are quite close to N-member Adamite. And this remarkable specimen, which is from uh, John Schneider's collection, the crystals range from N-member Adamite at the base of the crystal. You'll see the copper number there, just 1.7%. But by the time we get out to the terminations, we're 38.5% copper. So we grade in the one crystal from Adamite near the base to zinc olivonite near the tip. And then we have the other form of zoning, a concentric zoning. These pseudo-octahedral crystals have paler adamite cores surrounded by darker emerald green sheaths of zinc olivonite. This is another one where uh, the cores of the crystal are adamite at uh, uh, 16%, not quite at the end member uh, part of the, uh, the adamite range, but 16% copper, grading out to 38% uh, to copper in the sheaths. So uh, quite a bit of complication there. What, what we're saying there is we've got two species in the one crystal. The core of the crystal is, uh, is a copper-rich adamite grading out into a, a zinc olivonite in, the, in the, uh, the outer part of the crystal. And then we get to the pink ones. The pink ones are very interesting because it's always been believed that the chromophore is cobalt. And sure enough, we, uh, we do find some cobalt in the pink crystals here, but it's a very, very small amount. In this particular specimen, the average cobalt content was 0.05 weight percent. And that's enough in the absence of copper to give you that, uh, that magenta color. But what you'll notice with this specimen is that uh, we've got the magenta crystals on the left-hand side as you're looking at it there, as you're looking at it there, and then on the right-hand side of the specimen, we're looking at a, a banded crust of zinc olivonite with an average of 35.4 copper and uh, a cobalt content, content of 0 0.006 weight percent. This is uh, another specimen with two species in the same crystals, but now we're at the other end of the series. And the crystals here are alternating zones of olivonite and zinc olivonite. So this is all happening at the copper end of the, uh, of, of the series. And uh, interestingly, this is uh, one of the John Innes specimens that uh, I was talking about last year, in fact. And uh, this one was from the second oxidation zone on 35 level. And you'll see the range of copper, uh, copper mole percent there from 50.11 through to 79%. So just transgressing it across that zinc olivonite olivonite boundary. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, the Adamite olivonite series now consists of three named species. And those names are allocated really according to the copper-zinc ratio, which is distributed according to two ordered sites, one of which prefers copper, one of which prefers zinc. And as you transition into copper dominance in each of those sites, you cross a boundary between adamite and zinc olivonite initially, and then between zinc olivonite and olivonite. Cooper ad adamite is a discredited name, so look, I don't want to prescribe how people should label their specimens, but if you do want to be consistent with IMA naming rules, then these are not cuproadamites or cuprianadamites, they're zinc olivonite. And I think there's been a reluctance among collectors and dealers to use the word zinc olivonite. And I suspect there's a bit of psychology at play there. You know, I think people say, well, this mineral was only described in 2006, 2007, so it's got to be rare. But zinc olivonite isn't a new mineral in the species discovery sense. It's really a redefinition of a very well understood solid solution series. 
So we shouldn't be shy about using that name. Now, in the UK, about 10 years ago, Dick Braithwaite, who I'm sure many people in the, name will, in, in the room will be familiar with, and uh, co-workers, analyzed in the same way that we have, Cuprian Adamites from a wide range of UK localities. And they got exactly the same results that we've achieved here. And these are a couple of, uh, a couple of quotes from that paper. And these quotes seem to hold good at Sumeb as well. First of all, Braithwaite and co-workers said, Zincolivonite is a term which for most practical purposes is a synonym of cuproadamite. Absolutely right at Sumeb. And secondly, they said the adamite to zinc olivonite solid solution is one of the cases where color provides a reasonable guide to composition. And how many times have, uh, have we read and been told that you shouldn't judge a mineral just by color? Well, this is one series where I think color can give you a fairly good indication. And what we're seeing is that the adamites tend to be yellows, colorless, greenish yellows, browns, rarely pink if it's, uh, if it's cobalt, uh, co co cobalt bearing. The zinc olivonites tend to be, and this is all a bit subjective, but tend to be what I've called spearmint green, emerald green, or bottle green. And then the olivonites are blackish green. We didn't find any real relationships between habit of crystals and composition. There are one or two loose relationships, but they're not a great guide to identifying the minerals. So for practical purposes, zinc olivonite is synonymous with cuproadamite, and if you wish to rename your specimens, you can do so with reasonable confidence. But of course, we do get the more complex situations, and we talked about the hybrid specimens a few moments ago. And uh, just beware for the crystals that are zoned. And if you look very closely, a lot of adamite olivonite series minerals, the crystals certainly are zoned. So you may well have more than one species in the same crystal and more than one species on the same specimen. And the other thing, which I think is quite remarkable as a, as a, as a final uh, comment, is how little cobalt it takes to produce that pink color. The average for all of the analyses we did was just below 0.003 weight percent cobalt. And you get to 0.06 and you've got a lovely pink adamite, provided there's no copper there. Copper, just a little bit of copper, will mask that pink color uh, very, very easily. So that's, uh, that's essentially the, uh, the story. And uh, a lot of people, as you can imagine, have helped us with this work. And uh, just a quick slide there to say thank you very much to all the people who did assist us. And uh, one or two of them are in the room. So many, many thanks indeed. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Cheers. been described as being a mixture of Cuprian adamite and ferry lothar myorite. So where, where does the ferry lothar myorite, is the yellow color in this, where does that now stand? Is that discredited or are there some uh, specimens that have ferry lothar myorite that are in the yellow color? Neil, certainly not discredited. It's another layer of complication, but uh, you know, I have, uh, I have specimens where the core of the crystals is ferrolothamirite. In fact, the, uh, the one that we started the presentation with on the title page is one of those. I also have crystals where the core is tudebayite. So there is another layer of complication which we haven't dealt with in this particular piece of work. But no, I think that's absolutely still valid. Yes, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, we've always said as Sumeb collectors that if you have a, a, a new cuproadamite in your collection, you take it home and you put it under the microscope because a lot of Sumeb's rarer minerals are associated with cuproadamite. Well, 
Now, of course, we have to change the name, but uh, one thing I would say is I don't think you have anything like the same number of rarities associated with either end member, with the livonite or with adamite, but you do have a plethora of rarities that associate with, with got me at it now, with zinc and livonite. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, I was troubled with one aspect of this. Yeah. The zinc all of the But your talk then sort of devolves into a strictly chemical thing. But is there a prospect or a possibility of there being disordering in the substitution for copper, copper for zinc in the two sites? If there were disordering, you could have like 45% copper atomite, you would be properly a cheaper than atomite according to the way they define this. You could. In the, uh, in the original paper, the Chukhanov paper of 2007, they discussed the evidence for those sites being ordered. Okay. Now, this is where things get a little bit above my pay grade, and if you want to go into that any further, I might call on Martin here. But uh, I, I, I hear your question, but I don't believe that it's something we should worry about because it is addressed in that paper, and the claim is that our current understanding is that those are ordered sites. And again, I think it comes down to this Jan Teller distortion, which means that one site is more likely to accept the, uh, the copper rather than the zinc. But now you'll get the real answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, you know, the, the ordering in the sites is very nice. Why? Because it's a special Jan Teller theory in the quantum physics, you know. And I'm not going to tell you a lot about that because it's quite a complicated thing, but it's easy explanation. So both sides are octahedral. So, but because of the Jan Teller effect, copper has a special properties. <laughs> Always it has to be occupied in one of the sides because it requires a distortion of the octahedra. So zinc is OK. It's, the zinc is fine in, in both sides. But because the copper requires that distortion of the octahedra, it always occupies just one side and it's fully ordered. So it's, a, you know, the crystal structure of the olivonite, it's pretty similar to andalusite. It's really easy, you know, understand structure, but always because of the distortion, which is driven by the uh, quantum physics at the end, always copper can occur just in one octahedral side. So there is nothing like a splitting of the coppers because since the copper has to occupy the one octahedral side, which is distorted all the time, zinc went to the another one and fully occupying that one. So it's really fully ordered structure. Has, has anybody thought about the possibility <coughs> in some localities for atomite or all of the night, the presence of trace elements in the cation sites might distort that framework? We are working so with, some well, I'm actually working now on that as well, yeah. and uh, doing a, a synthetics as well, you know, so, and stability more things. Ahead, yeah, will be more. I think the interesting thing is that the amount of trace element substitution that we detected with the Sumeb series minerals is very, very low. Yeah. Sometimes you can have a, a bit of iron. There are some localities. But it I might not take much. You know, like, you know, the olivonite is almost orthorhombic. I mean, just like you said, just the Yeah, the, yeah. the, the shit is really small. Yeah. Actually, the, most of the crystals are twinned. So if you got a single crystal data, they look really orthorhombic. Just 10 years ago, they really realized. Thoman already was thinking that it might be a monoclinic stuff. We don't know what's going to happen, actually, with the libethanide, which is just a, a phosphate-rich right. part of the solid solution. I'm dealing with that as well. Looks like there might be, a, a, at the end, I own both are monoclinic. Because my data, I did a type locality for libethanide and different worldwide localities. And actually, I can see the full, full solid solution. Mm -hmm. And if the one is orthorhombic and the other one is monoclinic, it's not going to happen. Both are monoclinic, just we have to refine the crystal structure once again. Thank you. Sir? Yes. Were you able to determine on the, where you had the cobalt contamination, which site the cobalt showed up in? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't call it contamination. <laughs> Yeah, Martin? yeah, we can deal with this. Well, it's a rather interesting story in the in a Vivianite supergroup. I'm going to call it supergroup because it's not a group. You know, there is Erythrine and Annabergite, and uh, just a few years ago, this this lab 
described a new mineral from Joachim's Tal, which is babanekite, which is copper-rich member of the vivianite group. But with, you know, what do you expect from the copper-rich mineral? It should be a green stuff. It's, it's, most of the time it's a pink. <laughs> and actually the ordering between the cobalt and, and, and copper, in, in case of vivianite group minerals, you have a three different octahedral sites. So it's even more complicated because the split of the copper and zinc between the two is easy to deal with. But in case of the three sites, you have to think about that. It's a big chance actually for, for the Vivianet group that might be a, a, if the, we will be able to find the ordering, which we failed really. But the problem is the, the, the atomic ratio and the, it's so, so small between the copper and cobalt, you know, and the properties are so close that it's not easy, maybe, maybe, should be a, some sort of the ordering, but we never find a, a really a super rich member with the cobalt, it's always a little bit. That's a nice story behind the, most of the erythrites. I analyze a lot of erythrites from across the world, and they turn to be anabergites. Just a little bit of cobalt can change the color so radically, and you know, many, many specimens actually are anabergites, just a, a cobalt-rich ones. <laughs> Not the Boazer stuff, but other locations in the world, yeah, it's really common that cobalt really, even if you have a little bit of cobalt in, 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 a, in a formula, they can change a, a, a color rapidly, really, to the, to the pinkish stuff. So, but most of the things like adamites, this was the highest number which I ever saw. It, it's not really common, you know, that you have a, a purple ones, except of the Mexican ones, where manganese is actually doing a lot of, a lot of color instead of the, of the cobalt, so. Ray. I think because of our capabilities of analysis, as you've shown here, you can differentiate these things up to the eye, under the microscope. Sometimes, generationally, the new mineral is totally coated the old minerals that are inside. And I think I want to be blissfully ignorant because I don't want to necessarily tear apart my crystal to find out what's inside. So I'm, and I think it's just a, it's just an exclusive with this mineral group. I think it happens in a lot of minerals where you, you have, now we can determine that there are multiple minerals in a single crystal, but that's after you destroy the part of the crystal to find it. Sure. My question here was, did you, were you able to see superficially the strata of differentiation, uh, or did it all look the same on the surface and you had to cut away a little bit? to find out where the, where the different layer, layers of the mineral was when you had more than one mineral in the crystal. Yeah, look, absolutely. And I, I think we chose the, 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 the specimens that we photographed and analyzed there specifically because you could see the zoning. Okay. And uh, look, just to comment on that, I, I, um, I think most honest collectors have come to learn that if you go to a mineral show and you buy yourself a, a tourmaline. You don't call it albite, <laughs> you call it tourmaline group because without an analysis you can't possibly know. And I have no problem at all with labeli labeling these things Adamite Livonite series. What's wrong with that? Nothing but the splitters are seeming to rule <laughs> in the IMA. So I'm just sort of seeing this as another example of that. Sure. Yeah. Well, look, uh, the, the, the good news is that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I shouldn't put a probability on it, but I think if you were to say selecting a species in the Adamite Livonite series on the basis of color, assuming the crystal isn't zoned, uh, you're a 95% chance of getting it right, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Did any of the analyses uh, show up that mineral that was in that 5% zone? Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, well, one. <laughs> it was one point, which came in at something like 79.98. So, but the interesting thing is that the, the point at which the symmetry change occurs is not that well defined anyway. So the gap seems to be pretty empty, but we don't actually know to that level where the symmetry change occurs. Well, I think there are, there are two issues here. First of all, Cooper Adamite was not at that time an approved species. There yep. was a paper released by uh, uh, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Burke who listed 
78, I think it was, 78 varietal names that the IMA wanted to discourage the use of. Cuproadamite was one of them. But the IMA takes the view that you shouldn't be randomly tagging chemical adjectives onto the front of mineral names. And when you think about it, if you and I were having a discussion about cuproadamite, what are we implying about the amount of copper? We're talking about cobalt atomite with 0 0.00 weight, per weight percent cobalt. Does that deserve to be co called cobaltian atomite? No. You know, I, it drives, oh, those of you who look at the sumeb.com website, you'll know I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet. It drives me nuts. <laughs> People talking about cobaltian smithsonite, mangano and smithsonite. You know, my eyes aren't spectroscopically sensitive enough to judge different shades of pink <laughs> and, and, and say whether it's manganese or cobalt. You know, just call it pink smithsonite. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering if you uh, have worked a lot on the Mexican atomite and whether you think that maybe manganoan atomite could be a, a separate species also. No, I did the work on that. No, no, it's a little bit of manganese there. Do the same rules apply? No, it's not going to fit. It's just 0 0.1 atoms per formula unit of manganese. And that's enough for and the color. What about the, uh, the uh, cuprian atomites from there? Are they atomite or are they cuprian? That's a good question. Some of them are single olivonites as well. Not all, but there are a few examples. I think I, I mentioned about the study done in the UK on the, uh, the cuprian atomites there. Um, if you've been looking at the front page of Mindat over the last couple of weeks, you'll see that uh, Branko Riek has done a study on the Laurian oh, green atomites mm -hmm. and uh, come to very similar conclusions. It's a lot of zinc or lemon, I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a type locality idea. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Shame it's not soon up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, uh, again, thank you. Now, I'm afraid you've got to put up with me for just a few seconds longer because um, Ian has had to run away, so he asked me to, to close the meeting. And uh, obviously, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank every, everybody for coming along and, uh, and, and enjoying the afternoon with us. There's going to be food arrive. Well, it's arrived, I see. It's arrived. So that'll be on its way in in just a moment. But uh, before, uh, before we do hand over to the feast, I, I'd just like to thank a few people again. Obviously, Debbie, Ian has, uh, has thanked already. But uh, the... the She's drunk that bottle of champagne now, so <laughs> she's smiling. But the, the really big thank you that uh, you'll understand in just a few moments is to Steve and to Lizzie and Dave, who've done the food for us this evening. Now, um, Steve, Steve was here last year. Steve has come out with, uh, with the Crystal Classics team from the UK. And um, you've probably noticed over the last two weeks that uh, the Crystal Classics team have all been looking a little bit... Um, prosperous <laughs> and it's all down to Steve's cooking so Steve yeah. Lizzie Dave thank you very much indeed <laughs> and uh, and with that I'm going to say thank you all once again and, and please enjoy the food please hang around and have a chat for beer <laughs>